All right. As, as I said just a second, salvation can be compared with a huge gift that needs to be unwrapped. It's what we do with our salvation. That's what the that whole key of the white or the um, Lamb's judgment seat is. What did you do with your salvation? Did you just get it and call yourself satisfied, or did you just get out and use it and share it? What I was saying about the Jews was they were God's chosen people, but they weren't chosen to be a people set apart. They weren't called to be holy, but they were supposed to take that holiness and share it with the lost and dying world around them, all the people around them. But what they did was, instead of sharing it, they looked around and said, you know what? Worshiping bad, that, might, that looks pretty cool. There's some stuff you can do. You know, they got these sexual things that they call worship. You know, we can take that in them. So they, what they did is instead of taking God to the world, they let the world come in and take the place of God or took him in and made God also. And that's the problem is you have people saying Jesus Christ is, is enough to be saved, but you need to do this in addition. He's almost enough, but he's not quite enough. But every time that you get around somebody who says, Jesus is not sufficient for salvation. You either need to contend with that or leave it. But never go someplace where that's what they're preaching, is you've got to do this to be saved. You can't do anything because Jesus has done it all. But note that Paul is encouraging the Philippians to develop, develop and work out their salvation, but not to work for their salvation. You have choices after you're saved. Are you going to do kingdom work or are you going to just sit and wait for the rapture? And I've seen people doing that too. Every day they go, oh man, what am I going to do the rest of the day? The rapture didn't happen while I was sleeping. But I contend, and it's not mine, I didn't say it originally, but I contend that if the rapture happened on Saturday night, most churches would not notice that the preacher would drop in attendance on Sunday. Because there's so many professing Christians who aren't possessed by Christ, and that's the whole thing. Are you sold out for Jesus? Are you doing what what He's called you to do? Are you doing the bare minimum of what what you can do? But just as the believer gives an account of what they did with what Christ did on the cross, so too the unbeliever, with his rejection of the gospel, the free gift of grace and peace with God, there is. No free ride. Somebody pays the freight for our sin. Either the sinner or the Lord Jesus on the cross of humiliation. But sin must be accounted for by blood. Is it to be yours or is the blood of the Lamb of God who takes away the sin? Now Romans 14, 13 says, Therefore let us not judge one another anymore, but rather resolve this, not to put a stumbling block or a cause to fall, in our brother's way, because each of us will have to give an account of our actions to the Lord. Let us not make a brother stumble because of what we innocently do. I only had, I want to tell you who it was. I only had one lady that, uh, that had friends that were Catholic. And this when you, uh, I can't remember, couldn't eat beef, for, beef on uh, Fridays. Well, the lady was having hot dogs. And she said, oh, they're chicken dogs. Well, this was way before they had chicken dogs. Now, did, did it hurt the woman who ate the beef, dog, beef franks and thought they was chicken? Did it hurt her? No. Did it hurt the woman? Told, but that's the kind of things that could can creep up and create such stomach blocks because if the one lady had fat look over there in, in the garbage can and says, man, this is beef ranks on here. I have sinned because I know him I ate him. But that's what he's talking about. That's what Paul's talking about is, is things we do that make a brother or sister fall. If they think it's a sin, well, then it's, it's sin to them. If you think it's not sin, then God will, God will address it later on. And that's what he said. God will address it. That's why we're not to judge each other. The Lord told Peter, 
Now this this is this is my ball, one one of my barbecue uh, verses. But this is Acts 10, 13 and 14. And a voice came to him, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, Not so, Lord, for I have never eaten anything common or unclean. Now setting the picture of this, G, uh, Peter's up on a rooftop waiting on to cook some supper downstairs, and he fell asleep and had and he, during the, when he was sleeping, he had a vision of a sheep with a bunch of unclean animals on it coming down from heaven. Jesus said, Peter, kill and eat. And he's all, no, man, no, no, I never done anything like that. And he did it three times, and finally he was convinced. But, you know, Peter, he, he's always one. The first thing out of his mouth is, I'll be the best, but he's always the first one to fall. But... Jesus was trying to tell him that nothing's unclean. Well, that, this was in relation to uh, Cornelius, the, the centurion, coming to get him to uh, Jesus to come to his house and preach a good sermon to him so his people could be saved. And there was a, a prohibition of the Jew going into a Gentile's house. But that was a tradition of men. Because there were things that were done. We said it a minute ago. God wanted the Jews to take the truth of him throughout the world. That's what they were called to do. They were called to Abraham to be a blessing to the nations. But they never were. Because what they did is they took up what the nations were doing. They never stood up for what God, God's word said. But as always, Peter models hard-headedness for the believer. The Lord three times lowered the sheep with unclean animals and told Peter to kill and eat. Each time he fell back on the law and disputed with the lawgiver. Eventually he saw the truth that anything God has made cannot be called unclean as we read in Acts 10, 15, and 16. And the voice spoke to him again a second time. What God has cleansed you must not call common. This was done three times, and the object was taken up to heaven again. Now, we're not to evaluate people on their status or their lack of status. The truth is that everybody or everyone needs the gospel of Christ, the cross, the empty tomb. We started off talking about two trials and the evidence given. Now we're going to look at the second trial. This is in Revelation 20:11. Then I saw a great white throne, and him who sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heavens fled away. And there was found no place for them, no place to hide. But the great white throne is a picture of God's holy rule and judgment. The one occupying the throne may be God the Father, but, it's, but I believe it is God the Son, because Jesus is the one who paid the, paid the toll. He's the one who paid the price when he went to the cross. He's the rightful judge of the believer and the unbeliever. He's the rightful judge of the living and the dead. So we'll have to call that that it is Jesus. But he earned the right to be the righteous judge over the lost world. The earth and the heaven fled, fled in a poetic, is a, the earth and the heaven fled is a poetic way of saying and describing the burning up of this creation and its related works. There is no place for this sin-polluted creation in the next heaven, or the new heaven and the new earth. When we get to the part of Revelation, the judgment for rewards of believers is done. Anyway, what I was trying to say is, when we get to this part of Revelation, Revelation all the believers have gone before the white throne of judgment. They've all been entered into heaven. We've all done everything that we had to do or supposed to do or whatever, but we're, we're saved, we're in heaven. All that's done. There's not going to be any believers walking up and saying, man, that's a pretty white throne you got there, Jesus. Uh, there's no believers going to be doing that. What's going to be is all the unbelievers going to be on their knees declaring that Jesus Christ is Lord. And they're going to go, oh, no, man, everybody told me about that. Pastor Preston even told me about that. And you know what? I ignored what he said. And I went my own way. And here I am. Anyway, this is what Revelation 20, 12 says. 
And I saw the dead, the small and great, stand before God. And books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged according to their works by the things which were written in the books. Now, when you read, and the dead were judged according to their works. Now, I want you to get this picture in your mind. We'll, we'll say, hell is so many floors of hell. You're a really good person. You didn't know Jesus. You're, you're a really good person. You, you sinned a good bit, but you did some good stuff. So, Jesus is going to say, you're, you're, you're condemned to level two of hell. Then you got people like Stalin, Adolf Hitler, and people like that, and Satan. Well, you're going to be down at the bottom. But the key to the whole thing is, is whether you're at level the second floor or the bottom floor, you're still in hell. That's something we should all be striving to not have to endure. And we should be striving not to have anybody we know, love, care for, dislike to go through that. How do we do that? We share our faith. And we can't save anybody. You know, they're kind of always, and they say people that I really respect say it, talk about being so, say, I'm a soul winner, I'm a soul winner. You're not a soul winner, you're a seed, you cast and seeds of faith out. The Holy Spirit, the Lord Jesus Christ, God, Father, that's the ones who are soul winners. But all we are is we're, we're workers, we're sh 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 uh, sharing our faith. It's a seed of faith, and we may share it, and they tell us to just go away. But we planted the seed. That's all we can do. That's all we're accountable for is planting the seed. He didn't say in Acts 1-8 to, to go into all the world and save people. He said, go in the world and tell people about me. Go in the world and plant seeds of faith. Plant seeds of the gospel, and we will get it. We will get it fertilized. We'll get it watered. And we'll have a harvest, but your job is to plant seeds. And I, I pointed a young man to Christ, well, oh, this has been years ago. And I went in and asked his mother, I said, God, for, for seminary, I had to talk to do an evangelist, evangelistic paper. And everybody that we knew at the church, the children, we knew they had already been saved and baptized and everything else. So I was looking praying for somebody who wasn't from the church. Well, I found somebody, and I took him, and I asked his mother, I said, can I take him over here and talk to him? And she said, well, yeah, okay. So I did, because his mother thought he was not ready. He was only nine years old, and so he's not ready. I said, well, I'll talk to him. I don't have to get him saved. I don't have to make that happen. I just have to talk to him and share the gospel with him. Well, he had listened to church, but nobody ever went over and said, hey, you know, you need to make a decision one way or another. And he did. He made he decided to Christ, not because I was witnessing to him, but because the Holy Spirit was working on him, because that's what the Holy Spirit does. Takes what we do and multiplies it and lifts people up. But what happens is we get so scared about sharing that we're just uh, we're scared of getting uh, rejected. And as I said earlier, we don't get rejected by the a lot of people, Jesus is the one that's getting rejected because we can't save anybody. Now, if we could save anybody and we wouldn't share the gospel and they rejected us then, yes, we could say that they're rejecting us, but we can't save anybody. All we can do is tell them about Jesus. When we said the Lamb's judgment seat was for, for the Lamb's judgment seat Satan was the prosecutor and accuser of the saints to God the Father. He told every wicked thing we had ever done, but Christ our advocate refuted all charges under his blood. Because the saints were declared innocent by virtue of the cross, they entered into heaven. Now we're coming to the last judgment. Though not explicitly spelled out in scripture, I believe Satan's role changed. I believe Satan becomes the advocate for the lost telling the unsaved that they that what they did wasn't so bad and surely God will overlook their sin. 
if he can get one good but lost person into heaven on the basis of their goodness and good works, then God's righteousness can be challenged. As Satan tempted Jesus on the, in the wilderness to bypass the cross, he is still worth him trying to get his way. As we read in Luke 4, 7, Therefore, if you will worship before me, all will be yours. He was always trying to get someone accepted into heaven on the basis of works, not the blood. He was always deluding people into believing they were special in God but accept on works. Works without faith is dead as the half-brother of Jesus, James, says in his epistle. His overriding plan is, for, is to get the body of Christ to buy the false idea that Jesus is not enough but works. If someone is convinced works and good deeds will get them into heaven, they won't be looking to Jesus. How many people do you know who think God will make a way for them because they're good people? But when you start pinning them down on what makes them good people, then it starts coming to light. Well, they're not better than anybody else. But they think they are. They're deluded. But he did make a way to be God. He did make a way. And that's the Lord Jesus, as we see in John 14, 6. Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, like no one comes to the Father except through me. That's a pretty bold statement. But it's a true statement. Nobody's going to get to get to heaven. Nobody's going to be in a relationship with God the Father without being in fellowship with Christ through the cross. But absent the cross and faith and the Lord's shed blood and the empty tomb, there is no remission of sin, no salvation. And you know, a lot, of, a lot of people, when they witness, they leave that empty tomb thing out. To me, the empty tomb is, I won't say more important than the cross, but he could have went to the cross, he could have shed his blood and died, and still been in the, in, the, in the tomb, and we'd still be lost. But because he was resurrected on the third day, as he said, that's the promise that we have, that we're saved, and that everything he said is true. Because everybody else, every other founder of any religion you can think of, they're dead. Unless they just founded it yesterday or something. But they're dead, they're, they're in their grave, and when they died, they were still looking for truth. The truth is that Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, the life, and no one comes to the Father except through him. Revelation 20, 13 says, The sea gave up the dead who were in them, death and Hades delivered up the dead who were in them, and they were judged each one according to his works. The sea is the resting place of unburied bodies. Death and Hades refers not only to dying, but to existence beyond the grave. The picture here is of all intermediate abodes of human bodies giving them up to God's judgment. Unbelieving humanity is judged according to its works. Death in Hades, the Lord's final enemy, as Paul relates in 1 Corinthians 15, 26. The last enemy that will be destroyed is death. is also destroyed by being cast into the lake of fire. The second death is spiritual and eternal. The just punishment of the wicked. The first death is physically dying. Both are included in the overall meaning of, of the death that came upon the human race. This all happened because of Adam's sin. Eve was deceived by the great deceiver, but Adam in his own arrogance disobeyed God's precept. Romans 5.12 says, Therefore, just as one man just as through one man sin entered into the world and death through sin and thus death spread to all men because of all sin uh, you know uh, it's easy to get talking to people and they'll, they'll tell you especially this, this one who told me about said he was ready to go I may, may have said that in my head he was ready to go but he didn't want to be on the next load. But he had some, an older couple, way older than us, came in, said, well, Pastor, you don't have to worry about us anymore. We got that sin thing licked. 
I said, did you show them in Scripture where pride is a sin? But we do. We'll get in our heads thinking we're just too good. That, you know, it's just like when uh, they came to take over, come out of, the, out of the wilderness. You know, we studied about Moses and the Israelites coming out of Egypt and stuff. You know, they were in the wilderness for 40 years. But you realize they were only in the wilderness for two years getting ready so they could go in to, to claim the promised land. But they sent 12 spies in. And 10 of the spies came back and said, man, those guys are too big, they're too mean, they're too tough, the cities are too fortified, we just couldn't beat them. Then you had J uh, Joshua and Caleb said, hey, with God, we can knock these people down. No problem. Well, they didn't go with the ones who were saying, God, with God we could do it. They were going with the ones that, hey, we just can't do this. It's too much for us. So God had not marched for 38 more years in the wilderness until those ones who were naysayers, until they died off. Once they died off, then they came into the promised land. But it's, it's so easy to, to be negative about everything. And we, we see that a lot of these trials and tribulations that come through our lives and stuff, those are to strengthen us to get us ready for when the real tribulation comes. But hopefully all of us will be raptured out of here before that happens. Some false teachers and preachers want to say that those who had not heard the name of Jesus, and that this is a, this can be thinking, you can say, well, this is sad, whatever, but they talk about, well, these people have never heard the name of Jesus, but they're going to go to, he go to hell. Well, what kind of justice is that? Well, this is the thing about God's justice. Everybody's guilty. Everybody. The ones who have been redeemed through the shed blood of Christ through faith in Jesus Christ, they're redeemed. But everybody deserves death because everybody sinned, whether you heard Jesus' name or not. Now, I, I believe personally that when it comes to that, they're on the second floor of hell, but they're still in hell. It's sad, but if you think about it, the knowledge of God came from two people, Adam and Eve. They had knowledge of God. They messed up, but they had knowledge of God. And everybody from them out had a certain amount of knowledge of God. And if you look at most of your religious systems around the world now, you can see spatterings of God's word, God's word in them. But they've taken it so through the generations, perverted it, and twisted it around so much that it's not recognized. But they had it originally, and, and they lost it. That's not God's fault. That's the fault of the people tearing the things down. Just like the Jews, they got more worried about traditions of men than the Mosaic law or even what God's word said. This is what this is what Uncle Hiram said 200 years ago. So we're going to do what Uncle Hiram said 200 years ago. But what did God say about it? Did God say it was a sin for you not to get it to wash up to your shoulders? Just do a sacrifice, uh, not a sacrificial, sacramental wash. Uh, he, he accused, uh, the Pharisees accused Jesus' disciples of washing with unclean hands. Well, that's not true. They washed their hands. But the, the traditions of men, the church, the traditions of our forefathers was, you do this little washy, washy thing here, you know, all the way up. It's just, a, just add on stuff, traditions of men. And traditions of men will get you in more trouble than anything you can think of. Let's continue on. But the scripture says, all have sinned as we see in Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And Ephesians 2.8.9 it says, for by grace you have been saved through faith, that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Grace is God's undeserved mercy for those who believe in the sacrifice of the incarnate Lord on the cross. But as Romans 5.12 says, paraphrasing, sin entered in all humanity by one man, Adam. Because of Adam's sin, all without Jesus are condemned as sinners, period. 
All are guilty, but some will be saved through the shed blood of Christ through their faith in him. Now, Revelation 20, 14 and 15 says, Then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. Anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Only God's elect, those whose name are written in the book of life, will escape the lake of fire. The rejection of the eternal gospel results in eternal condemnation. Yahweh gave Adam all power and freedom in the garden. He only gave him one prohibition, as we read in Genesis 2, 16 and 17. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden you may freely eat. But if the tree but of the tree of knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in that day you eat, eat of it, you will surely die. I always say that people get a picture in their mind that Adam or Eve was over there talking to the serpent. He gave her some fruit and said, hey, go ahead and try this. And she ate, nothing happened to her, except her, she said uh, she was running after Adam. But she didn't have to run after Adam. Adam was right here. She ate the fruit. Adam looked over and said, man, she didn't drop down dead. He said, I'm not sure what dead is, but she, she doesn't look like she is. So he took a bite. Their eyes were open. That's something you need to remember. That the man's responsible. The husband, the father, that's the responsible individual in the relationship. The, the, the wife and the mother will be held to account, but the father is the a responsible one. The one that God chose to give the truth to to tell it and raise your kids up in a proper respect for the Lord. I don't know if that was a commercial or not, but that's what that's that's the case. We're we're responsible. No matter if Miss Terry says something, and I you know she she didn't do or she should have said. So well, my fault. I should have I should have said it first. But he, Adam, Eve was deceived, but Adam just disobeyed. Because Adam had a straight story from God. God said, don't. It was Adam's job to enforce upon Eve. Hey, look, God said, we don't eat off this tree. Now, we don't do that. And when she said, here, this is pretty good. Adam, take a bite of it. Knock it out of her hand. They said, no, we're not. Their eyes would have still been closed. They would have still been in there. But they would have found something else to disobey God with, and they'd have got cast out, and we'd be stuck the way we are. Because why? Because we have free will to choose to obey or disobey. And we need to exercise that free will to obey God. As I said, he only gave me one prohibition, and that was not to eat of that one tree. But the application we need to look at is that for the believer, Satan is our accuser before the Lord. But to the unsaved, he is, the, he is their advocate, continuing to delude them and keep them from the Savior, telling them, hey, you're a good person. Don't worry. God will let you in because of who you are. But in reality, it is who God is and not who we are that makes the difference. Romans 6.23 says, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. The devil is glad to advocate for the lost because if he can delude them long enough, they will join him. Join him in the lake of fire as we read in Revelation 20.10. The devil who deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone and where the beast and the false prophet are, and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. And all the unsaved, no matter how good or ignorant of the gospel, will join them there. Don't let Satan be your, death, your advocate, but let Jesus be your intercessor through his shed blood. Let's close with prayer. Father God, we thank you so much for your blessings. We give you the praise and glory for all the things you did. We give you praise for your word. Lord, uh, we just, there, there is such a, just a, I don't know, I can't even think of the word, but this country is so, so far down 
and the righteousness that, that we should have and we should be living in, but we're looking at everything by the status, the symbol of the world. We're, we're looking, even the churches today are more worldly than the world is sometimes. We're allowing things to come in the church door that 10, 15, 20 years ago would have never happened. But it happens with regularity now. And we have pastors, preachers standing up in the pulpits lifting these things up because the culture is accepting of sin. That doesn't make sin okay. God has never accepted sin as, as okay. And he's not going to rewrite the Bible just to make this generation feel comfortable when we're sin. We as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, we need to reach out to these people because they need Jesus as much as anybody else does, probably more. But Lord God, it's uh, it's a battle. And you, you tell it in Revelation, the book, the chapters we just finished with, you're telling all through there that all these things are going to happen. And that at the end, you're coming back for the church. And then in seven years, you're going to come back and you're going to settle accounts with everybody. But Lord God, we, we just, uh, we're just down here waiting. Lord, we thank you for your blessings. We give you praise and glory for all the things that you do in, in, in your word. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. 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 We don't turn it off. You already turned it off. <laughs> I should read this last slide. I don't know much, but three things I do. There is a God whose word is true. <coughs> Stay close to him, and he will bring you through. Amen. Nice. Uh, Thank you.